Hi, I'm Tom Gregory with Youngstown Christian Television. Today we got a new series that we're starting and I'm really excited about this. Basically, meet the pastor. The pastors that are with us on a regular basis that are bringing you the gospel faithfully and truthfully, we thought you should meet them, get a little one-on-one -on -one time with each pastor. Today we're starting with Rising Star Baptist Church on the east side of Youngstown with Pastor Ken Donaldson. Pastor Ken, thank you for doing this, sir. I'm glad really to do it. Appreciate it. I visit your church often. Uh, we've done some video projects. You host plays and theatrical productions here that we've done for you. Um, it, it's an honor to be here, and I'm so excited to do this program with you. So let's let's get started right away. Um, how long have you been a pastor at Rising Star? I've been here at the Rising Star for 16 years. Wow. Okay. That's a long time. Yeah. We. Yeah. Um, we have uh, endured the storms. Yeah. And so I'm excited to be the pastor here. I really am. All right. All right. I haven't always been, but I am now. <laughs> <laughs> That's honest. And it's one thing I love about your sermons, the honesty and the sincerity. And you speak real. You know, you don't speak church ease. You, know, yeah. you speak in, in real language that everyone can identify with. And there's something in your sermon for everyone, no matter where yeah. they are in life. I love that about your sermons. Yeah. So let's go back to the early years. Um, what was life like growing up? Where were you born? Where did you grow up? What was the family like? I'm born and raised here in Youngstown, Ohio. Okay. Um, I have an older brother and younger sister from my biological mom. Mm -hmm. And my dad remarried. And then there were three more. And then he remarried. And then there was a few more and so we are a family of steps okay um i grew up on the north side of youngstown mm -hmm. uh, ran high school graduate um so life really for us was um primarily for me was at, uh, athletics i was a all-around athlete what played sports? football basketball track yeah. uh, all year round every year until i went to college to play football and so life as a young man was um, very, very active. Mm -hmm. um, my mom was away from us when we were uh, kids. She was incarcerated for maybe 20 something years. So most of my time was with uh, my dad. My dad uh, took care of us and um, we call him uh, Mufasa. He is the Lion King. Okay. Because there's a good number of boys and so he, he raised us to be men. Mm, all right. Went to college at Middle Tennessee State University. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I walked on there. Mm -hmm. In fact, my brother, um, Tony, he was a scholarship quarterback there. We actually went at the same time. He went as a scholarship quarterback. I walked on and mm -hmm. um, later earned, earned a scholarship and um, started my last two years. So I, football was my thing. Okay. It saved me. Yeah? Mm -hmm. All right. So what academically, what, did you, what was your focus in college? Well, I started off as psychology. I was always a very um, intrigued or young man. I always had a lot of questions as to why. You mm -hmm. know, some of the background, my own background, um, I asked the questions why. And so when I graduated as an undergraduate, um, I found that when I started doing ministry, I enjoyed the college atmosphere. And so then I went to graduate school and majored in uh, education. So I have a master's in education. Okay. And ultimately I started working towards my doctoral degree in education. I wanted to be a college professor. Oh. Teaching education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Teaching teachers how to teach. All right. And so that's why most of my style and preaching is teaching. Yeah. Yeah. My thought right away was because you've got some other pastors in, in your flock here that you allow, you, you share your pulpit with them. Right. So you wanted to teach teachers how to teach. Now you're teaching preachers how to preach. Right. So right. So that's yeah. a lot and you of can't ties get, over. Right. You can't get good at anything unless you have opportunities to do it. Mm -hmm. And so... I remember when um, several years ago I went to Africa and what I found was a lot of the young, uh, brilliant um, 
preachers were not getting opportunities. So they were frustrated. They were venting to me saying, hey, mm -hmm. listen, you know, pastor never gives me an opportunity to, to preach. Yeah. And when I do, people seem to enjoy my preaching. And so they won't allow me to preach anymore. So many of those uh, young preachers will go off and start their own churches. I don't think that's a good way to start a church out of frustration. No. And so I have young guys who, who preach, some older, um, a, few, a, a few of them are older than me, but I give them opportunities every month. Uh, one of our preachers is, is preaching. So you were leaning towards a career in education. Right. How'd you get into ministry? What started all that? Well, I was working at Middle Tennessee State University where mm -hmm. I played football. And, um, and ultimately, uh, it really happened like this. I was always uh, already involved in my church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, mm -hmm. um, teaching Sunday school and things like that. I started growing in my faith. Um, was really, really interested in evangelism. I was never had a desire to, to pastor, never had that desire. But um, along the way, I would I find myself uh, somewhat critiquing my pastor in his sermons and other people like, I would have said it this way and I would have said it yeah. that way. Yeah. And so um, eventually I started moving towards a preaching because I just had a desire to teach, right? teach the word of God. My pastor, David Tolbert, was a, a teacher. He was a high on education, so it was a great uh, match and marriage for me. Well, long story short, I'm working on my PhD in education, and the cleaning lady and would come into my office, and mm -hmm. she would say, hey, she would call me preacher. Uh, before I accepted a call to preach, she would say, hey, preacher. and. Um, and I never was one to run away from preaching. I've always heard people tell stories of running. You know, I ran away from my calling. I was not a runner. I just wanted to be sure yeah. that God actually called me to preach. Yeah. As a, uh, many people, when they feel a sense of calling, they believe that God is calling them to preach. I, don't, I think God, when he calls us, he calls all of us, but we need to, be make, to make sure that we're actually doing what he's called us to do. Every calling is not a calling to be in the pulpit. Yeah. And so I wanted to make sure, and when I was sure, I responded. I went to seminary to prepare. Mm -hmm. um, still didn't want to be a pastor, but I knew that I wanted to be um, in a position where I could utilize my uh, gift of teaching. Mm -hmm. And so here I am. Utilizing my gift of teaching. All right. So where did you go to seminary then? I went to Dallas Theological Seminary. Ah. Oh, Interestingly so. enough, the lady that would come in my office and call me preacher, when I told her I accepted the, resp the call to preach, she said, uh, so where are you going to go to seminary? Um, and I said, Sylvia, her name was Sylvia. She, I said, um, black people don't go to seminary. She said, well, sure they do. She didn't flinch. She said, sure they do. And in my bookcase, I had uh, several books. One of my uh, faith heroes was uh, Chuck Swindoll. Oh, yeah. Who at yeah. that time was the president of Dallas Seminary. Mm -hmm. And she pulled his book out. She opened it and says, you know, look, Tony Evans went there and David Jeremiah went there. And, and she started talking about all of these preachers that I'd listened to. Yeah that I had great respect for. And I said, well, if I go to seminary, that's where I want to go. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I chose Dallas Theological Seminary. Wow. It was admitted, um, spent four years there mm -hmm. um, training, um, not for pastoral ministry, because I didn't go into pastoral ministry, didn't have that desire, but I was training for mm -hmm. um, basically teaching at some capacity in the church. I never had that desire to pastor though. Wow. Until my junior year of seminary. And um, one of the missions coordinators said, you know, if you really want to reach people and disciple people, the most effective way to do that is through pastoral ministry. And that's when the light, the light bulb came on as far as yeah. pastoral ministry. Yeah. 
So, well, obviously you were a Christian at that time. When, what, what turned your faith? Were you always in the faith? Was there a moment in your life where you turned to Christ? What is your salvation story? Right. So I, I grew up. I always had my grandmother um, instilled in us. She made us go to church. We had to go to church, mm -hmm. and so um, I always uh, had a healthy sense of fear of God. Um, my senior year, a young lady uh, by the name of Sonia Smith, and she uh, shared the gospel with me in a way that was more clear. Mm -hmm. I rededicated myself as a senior in high school right before I went off to go to college. Mm -hmm. And then after um, that, my junior year in college, I went to college and kind of slid back, but my junior year in college, I, I got sick and tired of praying the Lord, if you forgive me, uh, this time prayers. <laughs> and um, I recommitted as a junior in college and um, it took off from there. Yeah. Um, it, it really did. I really had a, um, a healthy desire to, to live a godly life as a junior in, in high school, I mean, junior mm -hmm. in college. Mm -hmm. So that's where I recommitted. Um, I joined Fellowship of Christian Athletes, uh, later became the president of our chapter there at Middle Tennessee State University, mm. started teaching a little bit, but um, that was a, a great platform for me as an athlete to start living out my faith. Mm. And so, you know, now I'm the chaplain for uh, Youngstown State University for the football team. So. That's one of the other things that I do. Yeah. That's beautiful. I yeah. travel with them, um, share the gospel, disciple them. In fact, I did a Bible study. I do a Bible study every, every Wednesday morning with those guys. Mm -hmm. All right. So because you had a career in sports and football. Right. That allows you to identify with them. Absolutely. Like you have common ground with them. So that your message to them I would assume would really be taken to heart. Right. And it, it, you know, they could identify with you. That's beautiful. God yeah. led you in certain ways in your life to give you all these experiences. That's right. So you, because he knew That's he right. would need you and he would want right. you in this position. There, there are no spare experiences. God uses all things. The scripture says God works all things together for good. Mm -hmm. And he does. Uh, the experiences that I've had, God has allowed me to get through them. Um, I can sympathize with young people who have parents who may have uh, been incar incarcerated or have made some choices in life. Um, by the way, my mom um, recovered. Uh, she was uh, saved in prison and oh, she got out great. and she lived a productive uh, life as a citizen and as a believer. She's one of my heroes. Beautiful. She is a, uh, she's a lioness. My mom was, uh, <laughs> she is a very, very powerful woman. I'm proud of, I'm proud to say that I'm her, I'm her son. I didn't understand the challenges that she had growing up until I became a man, but mm -hmm. um, God redeemed her. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That is a great, it must give you a lot of like not be prideful, but yeah, I'm proud thank of. Thank you, God. You're proud of my parents, and thank you Absolutely. for saving her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my dad. You know, my yes. God used yes. my dad um, in a mighty way as a somewhat of a community father at a time where not many fathers were around. My dad was that guy. Mm -hmm. He's the Lion King. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. You got a great heritage. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I do. So graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. Where was your first pastoral job? Was Rising Star your first church? I don't think it was, but no. I don't know. No, when I graduated from Dallas, I was a member of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship where Dr. Tony Evans pastors. Mm. So that's okay. where I did my internship. Um, I was not a paid uh, person, but I worked with the youth. Um, at that time, his son, Jonathan, who is now preaching now, Jonathan was in the youth group at that time. 
And so from there, I went to First Baptist in McKinney. We moved to North Dallas um, because of my job. And so I became um, a staff person at uh, First Baptist in McKinney. I mm -hmm. became, I was the, the first um, African-American pastor on, on staff. Mm -hmm. It was a predominantly white church. Um, in fact, when I went to that church, um, I said in my mind, man, I like everything about this church, except there are no black people. That's what I said in my mind. Um, and I'm just being honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like everything about it. But in the Lord, really, I'm not one of these guys that say the Lord spoke to me and he said this. Um, but I really sensed that God was saying to me, well, you're black. And yeah. so I continued to go when Pastor Jeff, um, Pastor Jeff was um, just a great man, a great preacher, um, just a good man. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when he found out that I graduated from Dallas, he welcomed me and asked me to teach a Sunday school. And then um, he says, I want you to take a Sunday school class. And so I took a Sunday school class and, mm -hmm. and then he says, well, I'm going to be out this summer I'm on sabbatical. So I want you to teach Bible study on Wednesday evening. So that taught Bible study. Here we go. And yeah. then he says he started, I started preaching there. Yeah. Um, not, not a lot, but, mm -hmm. you know, enough opportunities for me to, to get some exposure and some growth. And then from there, came here. Okay, so why Rising Star Baptist? Were they looking, were you looking? How, how did the connection happen? Right, well, Rising Star has a, a great legacy of sound biblical preachers. Okay. Um, Pastor Tatum started this church as a church plant, the Southern Baptist church plant. Um, he pastored a short period of time, maybe just a few years before Gary Frost took the reins, mm -hmm. and uh, Pastor yeah. Frost, um, somewhat of a, he's like the Tony Evans in Northeast Ohio. I mean, he's, uh, he's a man that is um, known for um, integrity. He and his wife has been married for a good number of years. He is a, a expository preacher. Mm -hmm. and there are not many expository preachers in this area, but he was one of them. Um, he built really a rising star Baptist church. And so, um, he trained his protege, uh, pastor Terry Bowles, who, uh, pastor Frost was here for like 18 years. And then pastor Bowles was the youth pastor at that time under pastor Frost. And then when pastor Frost left, he did work in the Southern Baptist, still working with the Southern Baptist convention in different capacities. Mm -hmm. Pastor Bowles was here eight years. Um, and then um, I came after Pastor Bowles. And okay. I've been here 16 years. All right. But the, the footprint of Rising Star is Pastor Frost, Pastor Gary Frost. He has, um, his legacy continues on um, even now. Uh, I've got more, I've, I, I believe I have my fingerprint on the church at this point, but you know, I've got great respect for Pastor Frost for what he did in the Youngstown area to, to start a church that is high on uh, biblical exposition and discipleship. Mm -hmm. We're big on discipleship. Oh yeah, yeah, I could tell. Yeah. yeah. And when the brief visits that I've come on Sundays and, and your Wednesday night Bible study, uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Why is your Bible study structured the way it is where you've got several handheld wireless mics throughout right. whoever's here and it's interactive. Right. People could comment and question and state things that, that mean, you know, identify right. with them. Um, why is it structured that, that way? Because a lot of Bible studies are just like a sermon. You sit Lectures. there and you listen and that's it. Yeah, it's a lecture. Right. 
So right. why do you do yours? Well, because you can't, you can't really help people grow if you don't know where they are. And so we believe that you are to engage in the Word of God. Um, most cults and bad doctrine does not come from people who don't read the scriptures, but from people who read the script, scriptures incorrectly. Mm -hmm. And so we engage the person, our, our audience, with the Word of God. We make them think. The Bible says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength with all of your mind. That means you need to engage in the word. That means you need to think about what you think about when you think about God. And so that's why we, we let people make comments. Um, we engage them. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. Yeah. And so um, also, let's say you're off a little bit, then you, you make a comment and the comment is off, then we can guide you, we can bring you into Redirect. correction yeah, yeah. with what the word actually says. Yeah. And so that's why. And plus I don't wanna yeah. I don't want to be sitting up for an hour and a half lecturing people. <laughs> adult <laughs> learners as a part of the education, mm -hmm. adult learners um, have to engage in the content for it to be relevant in their lives. And so that's mm -hmm. why we, you know, and I question I asked a lot of questions. I know where I want to go. I know what the answer is, but teaching them, that's what discipleship is, teaching them to observe. And that's what the Great Commission, mm -hmm. um, he says, go into the world and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded them. Mm -hmm. And lo, I am with you. So our um, goal is to teach them to observe. Yeah. We're to teach them so that they can become teachers. Hebrews 5, by now you ought to be teachers of the law, but mm -hmm. you need someone to present to you the elementary principles. And so that's an indictment on the leadership that does not teach people to observe and does not teach them to teach. Yeah. So and that's, that's true. That's how, we, uh, that's how we grow. Yeah, and it's, it's successful. And not just, I, I know your goal isn't just to get butts in the seats. No. No, your goal is to grow the kingdom. Absolutely. And it's, it's working here. It, it truly is. Yeah. yeah, I've never been a head counter. Somebody asked me, well, how many people do you have? I don't know. <laughs> I don't. That's yeah. how people gauge the growth of the church. But yeah. um, I think a better uh, gauge for growth is on Wednesday nights. Who's showing up at Bible study? Um, that for me is a better gauge mm -hmm. of the, the fruitfulness of the ministry or, or how people are growing. Are they engaged in the study of the word? Mm -hmm. That's true. true. So. so tell me about the, the sanctuary here is, is a beautiful sanctuary. Is this original because there's other parts of your building here. Was this an old school at one time? Was this always right. Rising Star? Well, this was, um, the other side was Thornhill School. Okay. And so... Uh, that that's was part the, of the Youngstown School? Yes, it was, was part of the uh, Youngstown School District. And, um, of course, we, Pastor Frost, um, they purchased Thornhill and then they built this sanctuary. And so we have been, I believe, in this sanctuary maybe 30, 35 years, somewhere around there, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, we, we believe strongly in, in uh, stewardship, taking care of what God has given us. We're stewards yeah. of yeah. all that God has given us. And this mm -hmm. is a, um, we thank God for what he's given us. And so we try to max it out. We use our stage, as you mm -hmm. said earlier, for uh, Easter productions. We mm -hmm. build sets. Uh, we, we try to max out this, the capacity of this building. So we thank God for it, um, appreciate uh, this facility. Um, and we try to use it for kingdom growth. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. So, All right, where do you see the future of Rising Star 
in five years and 10 years and 20 years? Is there a vision the church has that you're working towards? Is there a vision you have personally for it? Yeah, Matthew 28, you know, many churches do like yearly themes. Mm -hmm. um, this year we're gonna focus on this or that. Um, our mission every year is go into the world and make disciples. Mm -hmm. the Great Commission, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always. That's it. So what are we going to do next year? Go into the world, make disciples. <laughs> baptize them in the name yeah, of the yeah. Father. We're going to do it. Uh, so wash. Lord willing, in 10 years, you're still that's, doing it. That's what we're going to be doing. We're yeah. going to be trying to make disciples. The biblical imperative is to go and make disciples. Mm -hmm. How do you do it? Baptize, teach them to observe. And so I don't know if we need to be doing anything else. Um, in fact, um, I often asked if the last words that Jesus said before he ascended was go into the world and make disciples, is it unreasonable to think that when he comes back, he might ask the question, where are my disciples? What have you been doing? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I gave you a commandment. Yeah. I gave you a charge to make disciples. So yeah. how many disciples have you made? Yeah. Well, I, I go to church and I do this. I mean, well, if that ministry fails, uh, if you die and that ministry fails, it's evident that you didn't make disciples. Yeah, yeah. And so that's, yeah. that's what I see Rising Star do now. We should be increasing in numbers because we should be increasing disciples. Mm -hmm. And then those disciples ought to be making disciples. So if I model how to disciple, and then uh, the disciple should know how to make a disciple based on how I've modeled it. So we're, we're uh, impregnating uh, people with the Great Commission. <laughs> I like the way you put that. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's, that's what I see Rising Star yeah. doing. I don't have a desire to be a um, mega church. Um, do I? I don't mind if we financially get to a, a better position so that we can make a, a more impact. Mm -hmm. But as you notice, we don't, we don't even have a, a time for giving in our service. Yes, I've noticed, yeah. Yeah, we have conditioned people According to the word, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, mm -hmm. that your giving is a hard issue. It's between you and God. And so you know where the box is when it's time to give. Uh, I mean, when you, if you want to give, if you come and you just put it in the box. That's how we do it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, and obviously you have a faithful congregation because the lights are still on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, um, God has been extremely gracious and he's honored the fact that we have uh, trusted his word. We, I have never believed or never appreciated the manipulation when it comes to money. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I, I, I never really saw the giving, um, biblical giving model. And so I said, you know, I'm, I'm gonna just trust God with this. We paid the church off during COVID with grace giving. That's what we call it, grace giving. Mm -hmm. um, that means that we don't have bills still. Well, yeah. Uh, but to maintain uh, something like this, it, yeah. it costs. But um, yeah. we believe that God is faithful. If there's additional needs that arise, we're gonna do like the early, the first century church. We're gonna let the people know what the need is, Yeah. ask them to pray, and whatever they give, they give. It's between them and God. Mm -hmm. No manipulation, no uh, bells and whistles, just the truth is between you and God. It shouldn't That's be good. uncommon, but I'm told that it is. It is. It is uncommon, yes. Uh, in my experiences and all the churches that I've been in, productions that I've done and networks I've been involved with, yeah, it is, it is rare. Mm -hmm. Sadly, it is rare. Yeah. 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 So, a little bit of uh, rapid fire, quick questions for you. Mm -hmm. 
favorite Bible character other than Jesus? Uh, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul. I like the fact that he's bold and I like the fact that he is uh, willing to suffer for the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really like Paul. Uh, he's going he's gonna to tell you the truth. Uh, he's going to be authentic. Um, he's going to tell you when you're right. He's going to check you when you're wrong. Uh, Paul is, is my guy. Okay. Favorite Bible verse? Um, probably the First Corinthians um, 1, where it talks about God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the wise. That would be me. That verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 reminds me that there's really nothing special about me. Um, there's nothing strong about me. There's nothing about me that God would say, yeah, I want him to be on my team. God chooses the weak things yeah. of the world to confound the strong. Um, it even confounds me that God is able to use me. Um, but I like it and I appreciate it. <laughs> well, you're in good company if you consider who the original apostles were. That's right. And what they were before Absolutely. Christ got a hold of them, yeah. and the Holy Spirit empowered them to do whatever. Right. Yeah. They were not the who's who, that's for sure. No, no, not by any means. So you're in good company. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Give me the gospel in 60 seconds. Go. Jesus Christ died on the cross according to the scripture. He was buried and God raised him from the dead according to the scriptures. That is the gospel, Paul says, for what I, um, what I received, I passed on to you of first importance. And then he shared that message. Jesus died according to the scriptures. He was buried and God raised him from the dead. Summarized in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. Okay, okay. I think you made it under 60 seconds for sure. That was All done right. in probably 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, that was good. That was good, yeah. All right. Why do you believe the Bible is true? What proves to you or what evidence? How do you know? Obviously, you believe the Bible is true. Right. Why? Right. right. There is um, historical evidence that validates the authenticity of the Scripture. There are archaeological, uh, archaeological evidence that validates the authority of the scriptures. Um, the first century believers um, believe that the Bible or the word at that time was authentic church fathers. Mm -hmm. um, and not only that, um, I believe that the scripture is true because I've seen it active in, in my own life. Um, it's changed me. Mm -hmm. The word of God has, has changed me. Um, in Romans chapter 12, Paul says, Therefore, brethren, I urge you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, sacrifice. holy yeah. and acceptable unto God. This is your reasonable act of service. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing, renewing of, of your, your mind. mind. Then yeah. you can prove that which is good and acceptable will of God. The word has transformed my life. I've shared my background. Yeah. There's nothing special about me. The word has transformed my life. It has. And so um, the old folk would say, um, if you can't tell it, let me tell it what he's done for me. So I've experienced God in a very real way. Um, and that in itself um, authenticates the word for me. Mm -hmm. Right. Aside well from said. all of the other stuff, the yeah. historical evidence, the archaeological evidence, and yeah. so on. Right. But it's changed me. All right. Well, final thoughts. Do you have anything to say that I haven't asked or we haven't covered? Anything on your mind? Oh, I got a lot on my mind. Uh, <laughs> you know, here in the last probably um, several years, there's been a lot of... Uh, life loss. People are sick, uh, dying from uh, COVID and, and many, many other things. And I would just encourage pastors and leaders to um, make the Word of God a priority. Um, don't shortcut 
don't gimmick people. I think the church has lost um, a little bit of its authority because we've conformed to the world. We tried worldly means to to reach people, and I think people are are looking for um, an authentic church, an authentic people who um, who are open enough to say, "Hey, listen, I've got some flaws, and I don't have it all together. I want to get it together, but um, I don't have it together right now." So I think my last words would be um, contend for the faith that was uh, entrusted to the saints. Mm -hmm. Contend for the faith. Uh, be faithful to the faith. So right. those are my last words. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing the program with us. It was great. Uh, you give me a lot of information. Obviously, I never knew about you, so it's right. wonderful to hear all that. And I know our viewers have, have enjoyed hearing from you as well. So thank you for that, Pastor. And I, I appreciate your time. And folks, that's all the time we have for this show on YCTV. Thank you for watching and please stay watching. There's more episodes just like this to come. Thank you. If they speak in a tongue and then interpret it, how do we judge whether or not it's from God or not? How will you know? Well, because you're not the judge. Well, you, wait, okay, you say you're not the judge. Okay, well, let's, 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 let's see what the text says. Uh, Kenny, uh, gra grab, that, grab that mic up there. So the question is, if someone speaks in a tongue, the, there's interpretation needed because that interpretation does what? Brings it brings understanding, and when there's understanding, there is what? Edification. Edification. Okay. Go ahead, son. Um, I actually have a follow-up question to that. Um, Genesis 5, when we read that first time, it says Yeah, that's, that's exactly what happened in, on the day of Pentecost. They spoke in a language, the people heard God's word in their own language, and they responded. That's exactly what happened. So, let, let me just read this one more time, and then, then we, can, we can get to questions. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at most three. That's pretty clear, right? So we see a, a, a congregation full of people speaking in tongues. What should we assume? Is not led by the Spirit of God. Okay. It's out of, definitely out of order. And if it's out of order, it's not. So speaking in tongues, let him pray. Let the person pray that's speaking in tongues, that they will interpret. Everybody don't have, you know, that. Uh, the gift, gift of interpretation. To interpret. Right. Some people, when they get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you know, they get the gift of speaking in tongues, and also they get the gift of being able to interpret. So here's, again, how does the unbeliever, or even the believer, determine whether or not, let's just say that did happen. I don't think that's what that's saying here. I think the context shows that three are speaking one at a time, and then there's, there's interpretation. One person is interpreting what they're saying. It, it does not imply at all. It's not that God can't do it, but the problem with that is somebody gets up, starts speaking in tongues, and then say, well, God said, now how do we determine well, the Spirit of God, yes, there's a way. The Spirit of God will let you know if what they're saying is actually from God. That's the, and that causes a whole lot of chaos. Let's read, let's read the rest. I think it'll become real clear. I, in verse 27, I do not believe that the one that is speaking in a tongue is also the one interpreting the tongue. 
is highly unlikely, especially in the church setting. Highly unlikely. Because if you know what you're saying, if you can interpret it, what's the necessity of speaking in the tongue? Hold, hold, hold your mic up on them. Oh. Doesn't it say here, didn't Paul say here, that the one who is speaking in tongues, let him interpret it? You know, I guess if there was no one there who had that gift to uh, interpret the, the tongue or language that, you know, they are speaking. I, I believe he said that right here. Yeah, he, he says, he says, um, he doesn't say that here. He, he, I, he, he says that earlier, that if you speak in a tongue, that you should pray for interpretation. All right. Yeah, so, but that, that, is, that, is, that is an instruction to pray for interpretation. That is not, in this particular context, saying that the person that's speaking in a tongue gets the interpretation and then shares the interpretation also. What does that scripture mean, then? What does that mean? What it means is, if you speak in a tongue, an unknown tongue, you should pray that God gives you interpretation so that you will have understanding. Okay. That's what it means. Yeah, okay. Hold, hold your mic up. Hold your mic But what are you saying here, that if a person, if the person who's interpreting somebody else's you know what, they spoke in tongue, then that's incorrect? No, what I'm saying is, in this context, listen to what it says. I'm saying that this context seems to imply that the person that is speaking in a tongue, the persons, three at most, are to do it one at a time. And, and let's just, let me just read it, and, and then I think it'll be more clear. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three. Each in turn. So we've established that the max would be three people. And one must interpret. But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church. Now, here's a question that you may not have considered. It says, they do it in turn. We're assuming that we have three people max. They do it one at a time, okay? He says, um, and one must interpret. So there needs to be understanding, but it needs to be order, okay? Now, he says, but if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Now the question is, how does, how do you know, if you have the gift of tongues, how do you know if there is someone there to interpret? Think about, I just want you to use your, your, your mind with this because it, if, the, you are ten, you if you are attending a church and nobody there is speaking in tongues, it says, you know, you pray to yourself. You don't speak it out. <laughs> right. So, but, but, my, but the question is, how do you know? He says, but, verse 28, if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church. How does the tongue speaker know if there is an interpreter in the church. Because if you're attending a church long enough and you never see it, you never hear anybody speaking in tongue, you don't speak. You don't speak. But how do you know though? Even you don't speak. But, but, but here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. So if the Spirit of God, if the Spirit of God directs, let's say it happened tonight. Does I don't know who has the gift of interpretation. Right? So if I start speaking in tongues, let's say the Spirit leads me to start speaking in a, in a tongue. The Spirit of God leads me to speak in a tongue. If I do that, if I, can, I trust the, can I trust the Spirit of God to lead me in such a way that would not dishonor him? Can I, can I trust the Spirit of God to lead me to do something that will honor him? Right. So if the Spirit of God directs me, gives me the, um, the passion to speak in a tongue, 
and I don't know that there's an interpreter, what do I do? What do I do? I, I be silent? So I gotta, do I gotta do a poll to see? You know, the Lord has is, 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 is put this on me to speak in the tongue. Do I need to take a poll to say, does anybody in here an interpreter? No, no. Why, why do I not need to take a poll? Because the Holy, Holy, yeah. Spirit, the, because the Holy Spirit will not uh, lead me to do something if it that, wasn't interpreted out there. that would cause chaos in the yep. church. Yep, yep. Well, you know. Grab, grab your mic, Anemma. You know yes, I have spoken in tongues right here. Hold, 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 your, hold your mic. I up. have spoken in tongues right here in this church, but I did it silently, alone. Listen, again, there is, we are not saying that tongues is not a valid gift. We're not saying that at all. But in the church, what he's saying is there is specific instructions on how this gift is to be used. If it is used outside of this, these parameters, we know that it is not led by the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God does not lead us to do something that causes confusion. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying what the scripture says. But if you have, if you, you know, hold, hold your mic up. If you have the gift, you know, speaking in tongues, and just like I said, if you go into a church and you don't hear nobody there speaking in no tongues, you don't, you don't assume that somebody has the gift of interpretation. <laughs> no, you just, the Bible says, you pray like to yourself. Right, so, so I've had people that would say to me, um, you don't have an environment that's conducive for God doing something like that. So now, the Holy Spirit can do whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. And whenever he wants to do. And However, listen, and I've got to trust that if it happens, then God is going to provide those or one that would interpret. I've got to trust that. I don't have to feel it. I've got to trust, however, that according to this word, that if it happens, there is probably somebody that's going to be an interpreter. Now, uh, go, go ahead, Sister Blonda, and then I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to get in up the to reason, at least in the reason 33. Why, and the reason why we're going to trust that, because the whole gist of it is God wants his church to have understanding and to be built up. So that was the whole purpose of the gifts to begin with, that we would build up one another. Amen. Amen. So, Anima, you, you're absolutely right. If you don't, you can pray to yourself. In fact, that's what it says in verse 29. He says, but if there is, verse 28 says, if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Now look at verse 29. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others do what? Judge. Pass judgment. What does that mean? Oh, you judging me. No, yeah, I am judging you. But what does it mean, Elder Brown and then Sister uh, Blonda? The one judge would then determine whether what that prophet is saying actually came from God. So they're, they're literally, he's instructing them to assess what they're saying to determine if what they're saying is actually from God. Sister Blonda. And that's determined and judged by the word, right? That's the only way that we will know if something is from God. This is... By the way, God can speak to our subjective also. Let me just say that. He can speak through our emotions. He can, he, because he's God, he can speak however he wants to. But in the church, he instructs us to do things in such a way that the whole body is built up. He says, let him speak to himself and to God. Verse 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others 
pass judgment. Say pass judgment. Pass judgment. If you say you're speaking from God, we need to be looking at the word of God to determine if what you are saying is from God. Oh, you just need to put the book down. No, I can't put the book down. <laughs> can't put the book down. If I put the book down, I am going to, and by the way, I still can be deceived with the book open, but I am more likely to be deceived when I close the book Amen. or when I stop thinking, Amen. when I stop assessing what's said in light of what God has already said. Are y'all with me? Past judgment, verse 30. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, look at this order. And the first one must keep silent, for you can all prophesy what? One by one. One by one. So that what? All may learn and be exhorted. There's that word again. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Let me tell you what this means. In the last 40 seconds, you can't tell me that the spirit of God is going to overwhelm you where you just couldn't help yourself from prophesying or speaking in tongues. You can't stop it. This verse is saying the spirit of the prophet is subject to the control of the prophet. I have the gift of teaching. I can teach or I cannot teach. It is subject to the prophet. You can't say that you have the gift of tongues and then you, you and just, just say the Holy Spirit just overwhelmed me to the point where I'm doing it and there is no interpretation. That is not the Holy Spirit doing that. Don't care what happened, don't care what, I don't care about that. That compromises the word of God and the spirit of the prophet is always subject to the control of the prophet. You cannot be overwhelmed to a point where the spirit of God is going to cause you to do something that contradicts the word of God. Sister Blonda, in closing. So in application of what you just, uh, what we just read, so when there is a prophecy or when there is teaching, it's one at a time. So three people can't be up trying to, sh to teach and prophesy at one time, right? right? So it's just really one by one because if, that would be like if you got up to preach and it's three pre preachers and they're all trying to preach. Well, we would there would be no real understanding. Right. Right. So <laughs> I, I just, I, I don't know. That just seems so crystal clear. For verse 33, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. None are excluded from this instruction. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And when you see things done outside of God's order, it robs that church of its peace. And it's not Christ-centered. It's not Christ-centered. It might look like it is, but the reality is, it's not. It's not. Don't care if what happened in that, in that particular setting. So, oh, but this happened. You're out of order. Oh, folk, I say, you're out of order. <laughs> Father, go, go ahead, Sister Blonde, and then we can close. Um, I heard someone say, well, uh, Sister Blonda, I've just gotten accustomed to it. Yeah, well. Because they go to a place where it's, and she said, I'm just used to it. Yeah, well, I, I think now that you know whoever you, you're referring to, if you're watching online or whatever, now that you know, um, 
you should lovingly address your pastor, maybe ask your pastor or your leader, whoever, or, or the person. Maybe it's not the pastor. Maybe it's the person that just feels like they're overwhelmed by the Spirit of God and they're just doing it. Then they're doing it in ignorance. Now that you know, teach them. You don't have to argue with people. I don't think many people are malicious about it. They're just ignorant. Not that they're dumb. They just, how many times has someone gone through this chapter this way? Once you do it this way, it is crystal clear. But what happens is people pick this from here and this from here, and they, and they put together a, a necklace of theology that is not spirit directed. This is not rocket science. If you're speaking, if you have the gift of tongues, that's okay. If you have the gift of interpretation, that's wonderful. All of that. But you've got to use it in a way that honors God. All of the gifts, by the way, should be used in a way that honors God. But it is a gift of God. Yeah, no doubt. It is a gift. It's a gift. It's, a, he's, it's, it's, in that, it's in that pool of gifts that he talks about in chapter 12. And this man that wrote this, that God revealed it to him. Hold, hold, hold your mic up, my name. You know, he says he was an example of this hold, hold tongue it. speaking. <laughs> you know, he said, yeah. I speak in tongues more than all of you. Right. And you know he was an educated man. Right. But then he says, all of that, he said, I kind of as dung that I might win Christ. Amen. So this is a gift of God. And you know, we can't argue with God. Paul didn't just take his pen and write this in the Bible. Right. It was a revelation. Everything that he got, God revealed it to him. Right. All the revelation. Inspired by God. All scripture is inspired by God. It is God breathed. And it is profitable for what? Doctrine, re rebuke, correction, reproof. And so that's what's happening. In, in this particular instance, there's a lot of reproof because there is so much, there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding yeah. about it, and it is very, very clear. But you know, Pastor, this was a new ho, era. Ho, ho, hold that this up. was a new era. And those people, like it was Gentiles and I, I, Jews, but you know, the Gentiles, they didn't have no lot of spiritual, I guess, no spiritual understanding. And sure, it's just like when you get born again. How much do the average person know? Not a lot. When you are born again. Right. That's why we have to be taught. Amen. When I was born again, let me tell y'all, I didn't even know what the word born again or salvation meant. I didn't know. But I had, I was born again. And I had ordered a lot of uh, Billy Graham sermons. And so when they came, I pulled out this sermon said, the assurance of salvation. <laughs> and I told my neighbor, I said, this is what I got. It's called salvation. That's how ignorant I was. But I was born again. No doubt. No yeah. doubt. Yeah, so, so when we know better, we do better. Amen. When we know better, we do better. And so those that may need instruction, you, you're not the spiritual police, go to them in Galatians 6, restore them in love. You already established the love in chapter 13. You can have all of this stuff, but if you have not love, it profits you nothing. And so you know more, so more is required of you. Father, bless you. Thank you. Give us a heart to do all that you have instructed us to do. Those who need correction, help us to do so in love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all much.